All right, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. This is a um, encore pr uh, presentation of our walkthrough of the notice for a funding opportunity for our new uh, Chesapeake Gateways Tourism and Economic Development uh, Network grants. Uh, so uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, if you could um, please uh, introduce yourself in the chat so that we know who's here. We will be saving uh, the chat uh, so we can make sure that we get all the questions captured. Uh, and then also, uh, as we're going, please uh, add your questions in in the chat. Uh, my colleagues are going to be monitoring it and um, uh, we'll jump in when we have any questions that come up. So uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, we also do have a captioner uh, that uh, uh, my colleague Kate just posted the link. So if you need that, uh, the link to the captioning of the presentation uh, is uh, noted there. Um, I also do want to thank uh, our office. Um, this was a program. It's a new focus for our office, and there's probably about half of our office that was involved in putting all of this together. Uh, so thanks to them. And I especially want to call out Brent Everett, Mark Malloy, Sam Antha Ut, and um, uh, uh, um, Kate to uh, Marks for helping uh, put all of this together. So thank you. All right, we do have a lot to cover, so I'm going to jump right on in, uh, and I am going to apologize in advance that I'm going to be speeding through a lot of this. There's a lot more detail in the notice. I'm really trying to just uh, give you an orientation as to what uh, you're going to see, but I'm also going to be highlighting tools that we've developed uh, to help you navigate this in more detail. Uh, so don't feel like you're going to be overwhelmed, and we will be making the recording and slides available uh, on our YouTube channel uh, later this week, and we'll send around the link. Uh, that'll have uh, that. Uh, okay, so just to get us grounded, uh, all of this goes back to the, uh, for us, the work that we do is all based on the Chesapeake Bay Initiative Act. Uh, it's the act that started our office, uh, and I just highlighted some language here that's really driving uh, what we're doing today. Uh, you know, uh, through our legislation, we are mandated to provide technical and financial assistance in cooperation with a broad range of uh, possible partners. Uh, and as part of that technical and financial support, um, we're charged with identifying, conserving, restoring, and interpreting the natural, recreational, historical, and cultural resources within the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Uh, so just looking at these two parameters, uh, we have a colleague in our office that likes to say there's not much in the watershed that isn't our business. Uh, we have really broad authority to engage with partners in really uh, amazing ways, uh, and uh, we're capitalizing on that today. So as an office, we're not a national park. We are more of a community support office, uh, but we are bound by the geography of the uh, Chesapeake Bay watershed, uh, which covers six states and the District of Columbia. Um, as an office, we inspire and help people discover, experience, and connect to all the great things that there is to do in the watershed. Uh, but we don't do these things, uh, a lot of these, uh, this work directly. Uh, we do it by working with uh, people and partners that are out there uh, doing the on-the-ground work. So thank you to you all for what you do. And as we're doing uh, our, uh, whether it's collaboration work or uh, financial assistance or technical assistance, we're working at a, a number of different scales uh, from individual locations that are out there telling different parts of the Chesapeake Bay story, uh, watershed story, uh, to looking at the different regions that the watershed can be broken up into and some of the regional needs that might exist there. Uh, but we're also now moving into a new uh, perspective of uh, looking at a collaborative community level view of uh, being able to provide uh, these wonderful Chesapeake Bay watershed experiences. So to continue that, you know, the focus of this grant uh, is really to uh, reinforce this uh, concept of developing gateway communities as strategic focal points. For us, a gateway community is where there's a collection of resources and intention and purpose uh, towards uh, capitalizing on uh, stories that are local to the community that um, local residents and or visitors should know about. Uh, so in that, uh, contemplating what that visitor experience would be, uh, we hope that then uh, these places become uh, areas that people want to go and visit as, as a way of connecting to all the great things that the Chesapeake Bay has to offer. So. So I'll just jump right into what we're offering with this uh, grant opportunity. 
Um, it is to reinforce this notion of, of gateways as strategic focal points. Uh, the objectives are really to support community collaborations that link all the great things that the watershed has to offer with uh, heritage, tourism, and economic impact. Uh, and we, we want to be able to do that through uh, project support that helps communities really uh, be able to serve as hosts uh, all the way through be, uh, having the ability to host events that highlight any uh, local stories that they may uh, want to highlight. Um, so in uh, given those two objectives, we're strategizing the funding into two different categories. Uh, project level category, which is uh, at the fifty dollars to $100,000 level, uh, and an event category at ten dollars to 25000 And I'll go into more detail in all of these, uh, but this is, I just wanted to give you a, a summary of what we're offering. Um, like before, we are focusing on diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, uh, local economies, and community engagement. Uh, the local economies is new to this uh, offering, uh, but the other aspects are parameters that uh, we've uh, reinforced with our other two grant cycles. You know, we really want this to be an opportunity to have communities bring in stakeholders that haven't really had a seat at the table uh, or have been underrepresented or who represent the stories that there are to tell. Uh, so we want uh, there to be an opportunity for you to reach out and uh, use our uh, grant as uh, an opportunity to make those connections. As before, we are uh, privileged to be able to offer this grant opportunity with no match requirement. Uh, so whatever resources you're going to need for this grant, you're going to be able to put into the budget. Uh, and we'll walk through later on uh, what we're going to be expecting, uh, but there will be no match requirement. Uh, for this opportunity. Uh, we also, I mentioned earlier, can work with a broad range of eligible entities, and I'll show you the list later, but I do want to highlight that this includes the private sector, which is specifically called out in our legislation. So if you have uh, local outfitters, service providers, you know, any uh, uh, partners that might be part of the chamber, uh, those would be good prospects to engage in this type of collaboration and or encourage them to take the lead in a proposal. I mentioned that uh, you know we are bound by the Chesapeake Bay watershed, so that includes our grant making. All the grants, uh, the projects have to occur in the watershed. Uh, we do have the ability to grant to organizations that are located outside of the watershed, but their projects have to be within the bounds uh, of the watershed. And we have a nice county map here that we like to refer to uh, that helps people understand uh, um, or calculate whether they're in the watershed. And I will put that in the chat. Uh, and then new uh, with this round, and we'll explain what this means uh, a little bit later, but uh, all the projects are uh, going to be required to partner with the Chesapeake Gateway Place. Uh, we have a new um, uh, set of designations that we're rolling out, and uh, that includes or, uh, entities that have public programming, um, are telling some part of the watershed story. Uh, they can nominate themselves to become a Chesapeake Gateway Place. Um, this grant will require a partnership with one of those uh, locations, and we'll explain what that means later. Uh, so again, back to why we're doing this, it's really to help uh, enhance your community's ability to um, uh, be a host to local residents and to visitors uh, about whatever uh, part of the watershed story you have to tell. And we're doing that through uh, uh, two types of support, really the project level support and then zeroing down at uh, events. Now the project level uh, proposals can have an event built into it as part of the budget, uh, but you can only submit for uh, at the project level a max of 100,000. And the reason we're structuring it this way is that we know that there's data that says if you increase visitorship, you increase economic impact to the local area. Um, you know, I'm not going to go through each of these bullets directly, uh, but I did just want to highlight that there is a lot of data out there available and it'll be important uh, that I'll explain in a little bit. But um, we're working off the fact that we know that there is a connection between visitorship and uh, local economic impact. And the Park Service has a uh, website that they've set up where you can actually go in and gauge what the uh, impact is to the local, uh, if you're near a national park, what the impact is to your local community. I'll just put the link in the chat so you can play around if you're uh, near one of these. 
So that gets us then to the project level uh, 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 category where uh, we're expecting about seven to eight grants in at this level of 50 to 100,000, depending on you know the, the scale of the proposals that come in. Uh, and these are looking at uh, projects that where you're addressing any sort of issue or barrier or something that needs to be augmented or, or, or upgraded uh, to be able to uh, serve as a host. Uh, I'm going to put a list here of some of the project ideas we've came up with, uh, but this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, so, you know, if you're really contemplating some way of your community to better serve as a host uh, and it fits within the eligibility parameters, uh, that's really for you to help define for us. One of the great things about this grant opportunity is it helps us understand who's out there doing great things already uh, and that has already identified needs. Unfortunately, our funding is limited, so we do, uh, this is a competitive process, uh, but it still serves as uh, an ability for us to then understand uh, what are the different types of uh, activities that are going on in the watershed through our, our partners. So this list is also in the notice, um, but again, not an exhaustive list. So if you uh, are coming up with your own ideas, uh, as long as they meet the eligibility criteria, they should be uh, available for, for review. At the next level uh, is just looking at uh, different events that you might be looking to either already have and, and want to upgrade, or if you're uh, starting from scratch, if something you want to uh, uh, jump in with as a community, uh, we want this opportunity to be able to give you that uh, starting point. So you don't have to have already had one already. These can be brand new uh, to your community, but they can also be uh, events and festivals that you've been doing, but have some sort of uh, limitation that you've addressed that you'd like to submit uh, for a grant. Uh, so some of the examples I've listed here, again, not exhaustive, uh, but should give you a, a sense of your different options. Um, I also want to highlight that there is a whole other movement within uh, uh, across the country uh, to celebrate America's 250th anniversary. Uh, and the Park Service has its own program called uh, Countdown uh, to, uh, to 25, America's 250, uh, where there are uh, grants available through that as well, um, and uh, event ideas. So if you want to conduct a, an American 250 event, and uh, you know theirs is a national program, so likely more competitive, you could uh, easily uh, use an America 250 idea uh, uh, to apply for our uh, event funding as well, and or uh, the larger project budget as a theme. Uh, but we did list some uh, uh, sample examples as well. Again, not the, a complete list, but you know we're really looking for the types of events that celebrate uh, what you have to offer, what is special to your community, uh, and how can you, through an event, uh, really engage other uh, visitors and your local residents in uh, that heritage. All right, really quickly on the timeline. So we are at July 31st today with the, this grant application webinar. Uh, the grant is already open and I'll uh, get to the link uh, further down, uh, but um, the application window is now open. It'll close on October 31st at midnight. Uh, I do want to highlight that this is a um, technology-based uh, application. All the applications have to be submitted through grants.gov. We're not able to get emailed applications or paper applications and that portal will close at midnight on monday the 21st and we have no ability to to reopen it so i'm just giving you a, a heads up warning now please plan accordingly these are not grants to just jump in the last week uh, there are a lot of steps involved so if you uh, do intend to apply make sure that you're planning ahead um, i do want to highlight and i'll show you the schedule later down but uh, we will be hosting office hours that we have in past years We'll be doing one day a week leading up to the week before. The week before, we'll do uh, one every day. And then the day that it's due, we'll, uh, I think we've got the entire afternoon reserved. Uh, and these are opportunities for you to uh, dial in through a Teams link and ask your question, hang around and listen to other uh, questions. Uh, but it's an open forum for you to be able to provide uh, or uh, get your questions answered. While we're in an open grant period, we're not able to do any one-on-one -on -one consultations on projects. Um, so uh, being able to offer open office hours is a way for you to, to still get in, in front of us.
Once the application closes, it'll go through an initial eligibility review where we will look at things like, is it in the watershed? Are you an eligible entity? Uh, do you have a gateway place partner identified? Um, any of those parameters need to be met in order to move to merit review. From there, we enter into merit review where we'll have a panel reviewing all the proposals and rating them. Uh, and from there, getting a prioritization of the ones to select. Those that get selected will go to budget negotiation where we'll fine tune uh, all the pieces of your project to make sure everything's allowable according to our grant guidelines, the federal grant guidelines. Uh, and then from there, we move to award. Um, we are hoping to have uh, these projects, uh, all the reviews and awards done in order for projects to start uh, in the summer. But um, you know that time frame can adjust by uh, a few months depending on the complexity of your project. So um, for now, we just kind of list a, a general time frame. I mentioned earlier uh, that this is likely going to be competitive. Uh, just as an example, even though we're changing the focus, it's a really wide watershed, and uh, we've only uh, have a million dollars designated for this, which is a great amount to be able to provide. Uh, but when you look at the amount of need that uh, it gets identified, uh, it does increase the competitiveness of these projects. Um, you know, we're talking about one in five or one in six uh, that um, is able to be funded through our office. So just keep that in mind. You know, we make a lot of tools available to you. We have a really detailed checklist that tells you exactly what we need to see in the proposals. Uh, the more you can follow the guidances that we've provided for you, the easier it'll be for the reviewers to review your proposal uh, and likely translating into higher ratings. All right, so let's go into requirements. And I just need to check um, if my colleague Brent is on. Yes, great. Okay, uh, okay awesome. Thanks. Um, so under requirements, uh, I highlighted a broad range of entities. Pretty much uh, the only people that can't apply are individuals and federal partners. Uh, beyond that, it's a really broad list. Uh, so hopefully you're seeing yourself in one of these categories. Uh, and again, all uh, that we would be looking at beyond your individual eligibility as an organization is that your project then uh, does occur in the watershed. Uh, one of the other requirements that we're adding uh, is a criteria looking at uh, how well you connect what you're trying to do with uh, local economic Im impact. Um, and a good way to start assessing some of that connection between um, visitorship and, and uh, economic impact is to check with your local county, regional, or state economic development or tourism office. Um, if you don't have one at the local level, they'll uh, potentially could be one at the county level. Uh, but there will definitely be one at the state level. Uh, so uh, a good resource to look at what they have available for you as far as data. We do make, uh, when we make the slides available, you'll get all these links, uh, but we do uh, have provided a um, starting list of some resources that everybody would have access to. So we expect that you'll have the ability to provide some level of economic data uh, connection in your proposal based on uh, at, at uh, at the very minimum at the national level, uh, there's tribal data, but then there's uh, data available for uh, by state and the district. Uh, so if in the absence of any local data that you might have access to or awareness of, uh, you know, please uh, at least make uh, some references to the state data that's available to you. All right, the next requirement is um, that I mentioned is uh, all the proposals are going to need to identify a Chesapeake Gateway place to partner with. Uh, you won't need uh, any documentation beyond identifying who they are, but you will need to um, go out and make some uh, introductions about what you're trying to do and secure uh, their um, support as far as um, uh, becoming part of your uh, proposal, proposal so you can reference them. So what is a Chesapeake Gateway place? So I'm going to turn that over to my colleague Brent, who's going to go through the next couple of slides. 
All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Brent Everett. I'm the Director of Communications and Visitor Experience for MPS Chesapeake Gateways, and uh, my branch uh, helps coordinate the Visitor Experience Network, which is a system of Chesapeake Gateways places, providing opportunities to enjoy, learn about, and help conserve the Chesapeake Bay and its watershed. The Visitor Experience Network is grounded in our enabling legislation from uh, 1998. It's something we've been doing for uh, 25 years, but over the last couple of years of our refresh and uh, going through our new strategic plan and our updated framework, it became clear that uh, in order to bring the the full benefit and resources of the National Park Service to the Visitor Experience Network, we needed to, to refresh and relaunch uh, this network and this partnership. And so we've come up with a, a relatively simple process for everyone, those that were included previously and those places that would like to be included moving forward uh, to join the Visitor Experience Network. Uh, next slide, Eddie. So the, the place designations uh, within the Visitor Experience Network are all listed in our 2021 updated Chesapeake Gateways Network framework. So that's a document that's available on our website. You can go there right now and uh, open that up and take a look at the different designations. The five that are currently available for self-nomination include sites, trails, water trails, heritage areas, and connecting routes or byways. Uh, these are road-based experiences. Now, each place has, or yeah, each place designation has specific defining characteristics, and, and they do share some across all different place designation types. So obviously, all of these places need to be located within the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Their primary purpose of the site's management must be to conserve or interpret or educate or to recreate. It can be and or, but it needs to be one of those things. That has to be the primary purpose uh, of the, the place that is either managed or owned. It needs to be open to the public for visitation on a regularly scheduled daily or weekly hours throughout the visitation season. Now, your visitation season may be four to six months out of the year, and it's closed the rest of the time. But whatever your visitor season is, it needs to be open to regular visitation uh, from the general public. Uh, and the site must, uh, or the place, excuse me, must have sufficient visitor information to support an mps.gov forward slash Chesapeake listing. There are specific defining characteristics per designation beyond these four. Um, so I encourage you again, if you are, uh, if you own or manage a, a place that, that could be included, or you're going to be working with a partner who would like to be included in the Visitor Experience Network, the first place to start is in that updated um, 2021 network framework. Next slide, Eddie. All right, so to become a, a member, it includes a, a self-nomination process. Again, that's available on our website. If you uh, navigate to uh, any one of these links, it'll take you to that information. For prospective partners, if you want a more detailed uh, walkthrough of this process, the justification and the benefits, that video there at the bottom uh, on our YouTube channel is from our January webinar where we went through the, the full process in detail. Uh, and we do have the written instructions as well as a link to the online. It's a Microsoft form that you fill out. Each place needs a separate uh, self-nomination. So if you are an organization that manages three, four, five different places, you would need to submit a self-nomination for each of those places uh, because the information is going to be different for each one, right? Um, next slide, Eddie. All right. So in addition to being a grant application co cooperation, there are benefits to joining the Chesapeake uh, Gateways Visitor Experience Network. Inclusion on the MPS.gov uh, Chesapeake app, you have place listings and event listings. MPS.gov gets millions and millions of vi views, uh, page views a year, and we're tapping into that asset. Uh, and we're always updating and, and providing new resources to uh, the users of the website, so there's always new stuff coming. Um, one of the great things about it as well is that MPS.gov is going to, you're going to find it to be top search results most of the time. It's either going to be in the top two or three once your place is listed on the website. So it increases that visitor understanding and knowledge prior to their arrival at your place, ensuring that we have educated and informed visitors uh, at our, these places. 
You do also receive a pin on the MPS mobile app. Uh, the MPS mobile app has over 4 million downloads. It has uh, over a million active monthly users. It has incredible tools and power that uh, activates these places uh, for visitors and, and makes them aware of places they've never heard of before. So there's a great benefit to that as well. Uh, there are opportunities for inclusion and access to MPS application experiences. These include self-guiding and also guiding uh, tour experiences, as well as other things to do, uh, including thematic trip ideas, uh, which can be included on the website and on the mobile app. Uh, and in addition to all of that, you have the use of the MPS or so, excuse me, you have the use of the Chesapeake Gateways partner branding identity. Uh, we uh, those. The webinar that I discussed previously goes into more detail on that. And finally, you'll be included in Chesapeake Gateway's brand materials. So these are different opportunities that we put out to promote the visitor experience network. Next slide, Eddie. Okay. One. Okay. Currently, uh, we're in a bit of an administrative backlog or, or log jam currently, but we are going to be pushing through that next month. And, and all of this will be updated but for right now we have over we have 274 places throughout the watershed that are accepted just pending a signed agreement so if you go to this link which is unique to um this site and, and it's only the only way to get to it is to have this link so when you get this presentation after the fact you want to use this link this link is also in the nofo so you can get to it from from the nofo as well this lists all of those places by state. Um, so you'll just go in and find the state and then you can, there was a drop down list and you'll be able to go through and find um, the, the place that you're looking for. Uh, we will be updating this over time. So our current uh, accept submission period ends on September 1st. So we're still accepting self nominations right now. Uh, and we'll be updating this list in early September uh, with the, whatever we've received between now and September 1st. Anything received after September 1st, we'll, we'll just work on with those folks one on one uh, if they are uh, connected with a grant application. So just let us know and, and we'll work through that process together. Uh, all right, next slide. That might be it. Am I missing anything? Yep, I think that's it. So if you have any questions, feel free to pop in the chat. I can stick around for a couple more minutes, uh, but we are available uh, by to answer questions via email. You can send those to the grants email. You can send them to Eddie. You can send them to me directly. We have an information box that's linked on our website. There's plenty of ways to get a hold of us, and we're happy to share more information about the Visitor Experience Network and, and how to get a place uh, included in that, that opportunity. Thanks. Great, thanks, Brent. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned, you know, this is it's a requirement because of how we're structuring the view of collaborating uh, at a community level. Uh, we want to be able to highlight all the great places that uh, exist within your community and then work with those places to build uh, a strategy for increased tourism and economic impact. Uh, so a really great resource. Um, you know, we've posted the link to the YouTube uh, channel, the link to the instruction page. Uh, if you are uh, contemplating a proposal, and you haven't already self-nominated yourself, if you are meet the criteria, uh, please go ahead and, and get that application started uh, so that we can run it through our process. So thanks, Brent. Uh, OK, uh, the next I'm going to just zero in on the application itself. Pretty standard to federal grants. If you've applied to any of our uh, past cycles, uh, none of this will seem um, um, foreign, uh, but it's going to be all the standard forms that you'll need to submit, a project abstract, a detailed budget and narrative. Uh, we did add some uh, gu additional guidance in the checklist on the budget table and narrative, uh, because this is a place where a lot of proposals uh, just uh, uh, aren't as clear as they can be in how they're spending the money and what the money is going towards. Uh, so the more detail and more clarity you can provide in the budget areas, the easier it makes for reviews. Uh, so please take a look at the guidance that we've added in the checklist. Uh, and then um, uh, additional forms, plus then your project narrative. And all of this is detailed, uh, providing a lot more detail in, no, in the NOFO. But for the project narrative, uh, eight page limit, that does not include the required forms. That's really just limited to uh, what you're gonna be proposing uh, as the project. Um, but I am highlighting a resource here that we'll put another link to uh, later on 
but one of the things I've found in the last two years of looking at these proposals is a lot of them are really good at detailing the what they want to do, but not the why they sh they want to be doing it. Um, you know what it would what will be the impact. This is why we're we're making a, a emphasis on that connection to economic data. Uh, we want some level of assessment from you on why your project will generate impact and in what ways. Uh, so don't uh, definitely be clear on what you're proposing to do, but also what you expect uh, the impact will be. And for us, a lot of this comes back to that it's going to be competitive. The merit reviewers are going to have all these parameters that they're going to review by. Um, and if they're deciding between two projects, the one that better identifies the impact and provides better assurance of impact is likely going to get uh, is going to outcompete those that do not. So uh, please take a look at that resource if you need a little bit more uh, thought through in what the impact of your uh, idea might be. Uh, beyond that, very specific things we're looking for, purpose goals and objectives. What are your deliverables? Be clear on what you will be producing uh, out of this, a plan, an event, uh, some sort of, of community collaboration. Uh, where will your project be located? Uh, again, so that we can double check that eligibility to make sure that you have a partner identified uh, and what your key tasks and milestones will be. Uh, how well have you organized your thought into a, an implementation plan? Uh, beyond that, uh, these are some of the parameters that the reviewers are specifically, specifically going to be looking at. What is the connection to the Chesapeake Bay Initiative Act? For us, uh, all our work comes down to uh, those two parameters of uh, recreating and, and uh, connecting to the natural, cultural, historical, and recreational uh, heritage of the Bay. Uh, a link to economic development. Again, where is the impact going to come from? Uh, and then what kind of components are you including uh, that address equity, inclusion, accessibility, and engagement? These are meant to be collaborative projects. Uh, so in that, uh, there'll be, a, a, we'll want to get a sense of who you're collaborating with. And then the last one is that there is a community collaboration at work uh, here. Uh, at the organization level that uh, you're able to um, uh, host such a project and that you have the team assembled uh, that can implement it. Uh, on the proposed partners, you know, Brent uh, already explained this, but you know, we will be looking at what is your, uh, who your designated Chesapeake Gateway Place partner will be. You can have more partners beyond that. You can have even more places to partner with, uh, but we will be looking for at least one partner uh, to be a Chesapeake Gateway place. Uh, and then we also offer optional resumes that you can submit that do not count uh, to the eight page limit, but can help us understand who your team is. I do want to make a quick uh, highlight on the indirect costs. Uh, starting October 1st, the indirect cost rate uh, goes up to 15% as the minimum. Uh, currently it's 10%. Uh, so even though it's not, uh, goes into effect until October 1st, it will be in effect when we close this application. Uh, so all the projects should already start factoring in. Uh, uh, if you're going to choose to include an indirect, uh, you are allowed up to 15% minimum uh, unless you have a negotiated rate, a NICRA, where you have negotiated a rate higher than or other than 15%. Um, we also want to caveat that this isn't 15% on the entire project. It's really specific to certain line items uh, from your project. We have some of them listed here and you'll see more guidance in the NOFO and the checklist. Uh, but those will be things that we'll also be checking in in budget review uh, if you get uh, selected. Speaking of proposal review, I uh, referred to this earlier, but after all the proposals come in, we'll do a, a initial eligibility check to make sure that all the proposals are eligible to go to merit review. Uh, we'll be assembling a panel while uh, we're in uh, the application phase and uh, of merit reviewers, which will be uh, an assortment of uh, federal contacts that have some sort of expertise in either um, tourism, community engagement, collaboration, uh, economic impact, uh, you know, individuals that will have the kind of expertise we need to review your proposals. Uh, and then from there, they make uh, recommendations for selections. We forward those to our awarding official and they um, will certify all the awards and then we issue the awards. 
really quickly on review criteria. Uh, we have weighted these to emphasize uh, what we were gonna, what are what we're hoping to see in each of the proposals at twenty percent. Again, that connection back to the Chesapeake Bay Initiative Act. How well are you zeroing in on some part of the Chesapeake Bay heritage, watershed heritage? Connection to economic development. Are you making a link between what you're trying to do and local economic impact? These are projects that should be uh, available or should be viewed as um, benefits to your community. The connection to equity, inclusion, accessibility, and engagement. Again, we want to see what types of uh, uh, partners you're collaborating with, how you're engaging them in the project, and what roles do they have. Investments in community collaborations, just the scale of collaboration you're looking at uh, and um, their involvement in the, the actual implementation. The clarity of your operational plan. Uh, is what you're proposing, does it make sense? Does it uh, read like something that is doable? Um, all the reviewers are going to have to go by is what you write into your eight pages. Uh, so make sure that you're able to spell out uh, what you're planning uh, to do and what impact you're expecting. Uh, and then your capacity to do the project. Uh, does it come across to the reviewers that you've thought through uh, all the different moving pieces and the roles and responsibilities that are going to uh, need to be uh, defined to address those moving pieces. OK, getting into a little bit more nuts and bolts here. Before you begin, uh, as I mentioned, everything has to be submitted through grants.gov. But before you can uh, start on the application, you need to be registered with the System for Award Management. Uh, this is a, another federal uh, uh, system that every entity that gets any sort of financial support, whether it's contracts or grants or uh, cooperative agreements, has to be logged in the system of award management first. Uh, you will go through a registration process if you haven't already, uh, and through that process, you will obtain a unique entity identifier. This will be a number that is specific to you. That means that the federal government has um, done all its due diligence to make sure that you are an entity that can receive money from the federal government. You cannot apply without that UEI. Um, and I'm highlighting this because the process, uh, I did it as a sample. When I did it, it was about two weeks turnaround time. Some of the grantees I've heard, you know, it can take up to about two months. So if you don't already have one, I would at the finish of this webinar immediately uh, start uh, that process. Uh, we did do a grant uh, or webinar on this in 2022 that's still relevant, so there'll be a link in the slide if you scroll to the uh, minute 22 uh, and six seconds, you'll see the start of the discussion on um, system for award management, and then there's uh, additional topics that you might find interesting in our uh, playlist. Application tool. So we're trying to make this as easy for you as possible, uh, not just in um, translating the notice, but also in giving you some tools to help uh, you know increase your competitiveness in your proposal. Uh, we've have some presentations we've done in the past uh, that uh, if you need additional assistance in advancing your inclusivity in your project idea, uh, one of our colleagues, Brittany Hall, did a great presentation on uh, how to uh, be more mindful of DEIJA uh, in your programming. And then, as I mentioned, uh, we did a webinar last year on logic modeling, which is a way of helping you define impact. It takes you through a step by step of what are your activities? What are you hoping to see from those activities and what kind of impact uh, would would uh, that result in? Uh, so a good, really good tool if you need help coming up with some impact language. We also did a whole webinar. We partnered with West Virginia University to do a whole webinar on just the federal budget, uh, which can be a beast of its own. It has its own form. Uh, it is very uh, uh, prescriptive in uh, the kinds of ways that you need to be filling in these numbers, and it can trip you up. Uh, so if you've never done a federal grant before and you need some assistance on tips on uh, doing your federal budget, please, uh, look at that webinar. And then, you know, I mentioned there's a library of additional topics that might interest you. Uh, we also have a landing page, which will be probably your primary resource for accessing uh, information related to this grant opportunity. 
Uh, we have a, a pretty well-defined uh, list of frequently asked questions. There's probably, I'd say, maybe 200 questions in there on everything and anything that uh, you might uh, be thinking about. So start there if you already want to jump in uh, and um, you know, you'll see some of the questions that have already been asked and that'll get you really thinking about uh, where your starting point might be. I've been mentioning the checklist a lot. Uh, again, reading the NOFO, it's got a lot of legalese in it. It is a federal document. So what we've done is we've created a checklist to help walk you through all the different sections of it, uh, including all the pre-application work that, you know, have you gone through SAM? Have you gotten your UEI? Um, we've made it so that it's easy. It should be easy enough for you to, through that guidance, to assemble your proposal uh, and make sure that all the pieces are there. Uh, I know, uh, you know, a lot of you are sitting on proposal you've used in the past, and it might be just easy to, uh, you know, add a different cover and forward it on. Uh, but the reviewers, it's, it makes it very difficult if they're having to uh, uh, search for the kind of information that we're looking for uh, in order to compare all the uh, proposals together, uh, particularly if they're reading a lot of these. So the easier you can make it for them, um, the better it'll translate into ratings for your project idea. Uh, so check out the checklist, all the links that I had for the economic data are in one of the appendices. We list a sample budget table. Uh, we define all the budget categories to help you organize how you're putting uh, your budget together. Uh, and then you can also get to the uh, notice directly from our link. Um, you can go to grants.gov and search for it, uh, but uh, sometimes it's easier just to go to our website uh, because we've got these other tools and you can get right to it from uh, from the landing page. Once you go there, though, you know, it is the government. There's multiple layers involved in the way we do our work. So one of the things you'll need to do to access the grants.gov application is create a login for yourself. Um, and there's a whole other process at login.gov. So if you don't already have that, uh, you'll need to go through that process too. That'll give you a unique login that you'll be able to use in federal websites all across the service, uh, all across the uh, government, including grants.gov. Uh, so it's a, a system for award management, uh, login.gov, grants.gov, uh, you know, all those pieces are done in, in, in sequence in order for you to then get to the application and, and submit. So I know I gave you a lot. Uh, you're, there's going to be a lot for you to uh, sift through and, and start doing some research on, on what kind of plan you want to put together for your uh, proposal, uh, but we don't want to, you know, uh, leave you hanging. We do have a, uh, office hours set up for um, to be able to assist you. They're going to be every uh, Thursday leading up to the week before, and then the week before it's a holiday on Monday, so we're only operating Tuesday through Friday that day, but it's every day four to five. Uh, and then the day that the applications are due, we'll uh, have the office uh, hour open from uh, two to five to give you plenty of chances um, to get your last minute questions answered. Uh, again, a caution, these are not easy processes. Do not wait to the last week. Uh, you know, get started on your UEI now. Make sure you've got your login all set up uh, so that you can access the system. The system will close down at midnight on the 21st. So you don't want to be scrambling five minutes to midnight uh, trying to get all your pieces together. Uh, we get a report on when these get submitted, and I'm pretty amazed at how many are submitted within five minutes of the website closing. So, um, you know, just bear that in mind. And uh, from there, if you have any questions about um, any part of the process, my contact information is here uh, through the visitor uh, experience network uh, instructions. You can get to Brent's contact information for that aspect of it. Uh, but plenty of opportunities for you to uh, ask questions. We also have a, a grants email. Uh, any uh, question that gets through that gets uh, funneled uh, to the grants team. Um, and then the grants landing page has a lot of resources for you to, to use.